Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week we are going to be talking about the solved case of Megan Newton. She was a teenager girl who lived in the West Midlands region of England and when she was tragically found murdered one morning a police investigation began immediately to try and identify the perpetrator and it was video footage that would ultimately provide a huge breakthrough in this case as this footage revealed who Megan was with just moments before she was brutally killed but quickly before we get into the case please listen carefully to the following this video is about the murder of a young woman and involves heavy themes such as violence towards women, rape and sexual assault and also the theme of suicide is mentioned. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back more than four years now to the spring of 2019 in Stoke-on-Trent which is a city located in the county of Staffordshire in England and this is Megan Newton. She was a young woman who lived in Stoke-on-Trent. Megan was 18 years old at the time that this case took place. She was born in 2001 to parents Michael and Sarah and according to news articles I read she also had a half-sister called Demi and I believe Demi was Michael's daughter as Megan was her mum Sarah's only child and Megan and her mum were incredibly close to the point where Sarah said that they weren't just mother and daughter, they were also best friends. They loved each other so much. Sarah described her daughter as always being a very adventurous adventurous girl all throughout her childhood. She just loved being very active. You know, she would do things like climb trees and she was just a bit of a daredevil and very ambitious. But as well as that, she was described by those that knew her as being very funny. She had a good sense of humour. Megan was loving and kind and caring and her grandparents said that she just had a heart of gold. She was always willing to help others, always looking out for others. Even when she was a young child, her family recall how when Megan was in primary school there was this other young girl in her class who was from China and she didn't speak any English bless her so as you can imagine it was probably very daunting for her to be in a school surrounded by other kids and teachers who all spoke a different language that she didn't understand but knowing how kind and caring Megan was the teacher of the class had Megan sit next to this girl and despite the language barrier her grandparents said that Megan really Really took her under her wing and she started trying to teach this girl some English words. So by the time she left the school and she went back to China she did actually know basic English because Megan had taken the time to teach her. So that just shows how thoughtful and generous Megan was even at such a young age and she carried that into her teenage years and early adulthood. In addition to all of that Megan was also a very sociable girl. She was very much a people person and she loved sports. Sports. As I said, she was a very active person. And yeah, she just loved all sports, but particularly football. She was on a women's football team in Stoke-on-Trent and sources state that she loved getting involved in coaching kids football teams. Apparently on the weekends, she would coach a football team for under seven-year-old girls and she would like take part in fundraisers to raise money for the team football kits. Megan just absolutely thrived in that kind of environment. She was so so passionate about all things sport and football. In fact I believe she even had a little like tattoo of a football boot. That's how much she loved it and she loved it so much that she decided that that was what she wanted to do as a career and by the time this case occurred she was in college doing her studies with a vision to becoming either a sports therapist or a physiotherapist in the future and she was really looking forward to eventually going to university because apparently no no one in her family had ever been to uni before so she was really excited that she was going to be the first one. All in all Megan Newton was just a beautiful and talented young woman who had so much promise and potential, who had an exciting future ahead of her but heartbreakingly it was a future that she would never get to see due to the horrific event that was to take place in April of 2019. The date was Friday the 19th of April 2019 
18 and I believe it was a day that began just as any other for 18 year old Megan Newton. That evening Megan worked a shift at a local fish and chip shop. She worked there part time and when her shift ended at around 10.20pm she headed back home. Now Megan had actually moved out by this point. She was no longer living with family. She had moved out into a flat which was located within a block of flats on Fletcher Road in Stoke-on-Trent and I believe she did live alone as far as I'm aware she didn't have a roommate or anything. So she went back to her flat after her shift, she got changed, she put some makeup on and then she headed back out to meet some friends because it was a Friday night and she and her friends had decided to go on a night out together that evening. So at quarter to 11 Megan left her flat, she met up with her friends and they went to a nightclub. They decided to go clubbing in the Newcastle under Lyme area of Staffordshire and according to her friends Megan had a really nice night. She had a couple of drinks, she had a dance, she was just having fun. One of her friends Holly said in a documentary that I watched about this case that Megan honestly just had a smile on her face the whole night. And then in the early hours of the Saturday morning, just before 2.45am, Megan and one of her girlfriends got into a taxi. And this taxi took them both back to their homes. It took Megan back to her flat. It appeared as though she had gotten home safely and she was in for the night. However, later that same morning, so after sunrise, a neighbour who I believe also lived within the same apartment building or block of flats as Megan on Fletcher Road, they discovered a set of keys on the ground just outside of the block of flats and horrifyingly it looked as though these keys had blood on them. They were covered in blood. So this neighbour gave these keys to one of the staff members who worked in this particular block of flats and because the keys had blood on them, the member of staff decided that they should probably check on the flat, check on the person who lived there, check that they were okay. So they used the keys to get into the flat that they had come from and as they walked inside this staff member stumbled upon a gruesome scene. Inside this flat was the dead body of a young woman. She was just lying face down on a bed, she was naked and she was covered in blood from where she had very clearly been stabbed with a knife repeatedly and this young woman would quickly be identified as 18 year old Megan Newton and this was Megan's flat. She had been brutally murdered inside of her own home. So as soon as Megan's body was found of course the police were immediately alerted and called to the scene and Megan's family were informed. And just to confirm that the body was that of Megan Newton her family did have to formally identify her in the morgue where of course they tragically confirmed that yes it was her. The crime scene was obviously cornered off by the police and forensic teams were sent into Megan's flat to collect any potential evidence and when Megan's autopsy was conducted the truth about the sheer terror that Megan had been subjected to came to light. Megan had been the victim of a horrific attack. Not only has she been stabbed numerous times but she had also been strangled as well as sexually assaulted. It was determined that she had been raped by her killer. The medical examiner did determined that she had been manually strangled by the attacker first. They strangled her for somewhere between 15 to 30 seconds but not to death. She wasn't strangled to death. It's believed that she was just strangled until she was knocked out, until she lost consciousness and then the killer grabbed a knife I believe from Megan's kitchen and they stabbed her a total of nine times in her back and also in the back of her neck. It's thought that she was unconscious when the stab wounds were inflicted and that that was ultimately what killed her. Now a knife was found at the scene and it was believed that this knife was the murder weapon so this along with the bloody set of keys was sent off for testing in the hopes that scientists might be able to retrieve some of the killer's DNA from these items. Obviously if you think about it the person who must have left these keys outside of the block of flats had to have been the killer because of the fact that blood was was on them. The blood indicates that they were dropped outside after Megan was killed. So they must have been dropped 
by the murderer as they were leaving the scene of the crime. Now once the police had obviously launched a murder inquiry, one of the first things that they wanted to do was establish Megan's movements on the night that she was killed. And after speaking to friends and family, they learned that she had been out that night. She'd been on a night out with friends until she left the club to go home in the early hours of the morning. And so the police turned to CCTV in an attempt to trace her last steps and also possibly identify her killer. They checked the CCTV camera from in and around the nightclub that Megan had been to that night and something immediately stood out to the police. When Megan left the nightclub at approximately 2.42 a.m., the police noticed on CCTV footage from outside the club that she got into a taxi with a girlfriend of hers and also a man, a young man got into this taxi with them. So the police wondered who this man was and could he have had anything to do with Megan's murder? And it wasn't long before this young man cropped up again in some other CCTV footage. You see, the police checked the CCTV cameras from inside the block of flats where Megan lived. And luckily for them, it turns out that there was actually a CCTV camera in the hall, in the communal hall, right by Megan's front door. In fact, the front door to her flat was in view of this CCTV camera, which meant that the police would be able to see who had gone in and out of her flat that night. They would hopefully be able to see the killer. So they checked the footage from this camera from the early hours of the morning, and at around 3.44 a.m., Megan is seen walking into the block of flats with the same young man that she got into the taxi with about an hour before before. Together they walk into the building and up to Megan's front door and everything looks fine between them. Megan looks fine, she looks happy, she kind of does a little skip to her front door as the man follows behind her which indicates that she wasn't feeling you know scared or nervous or unsafe in his presence and then she unlocks her front door and the two of them go inside the flat. However something that the police observed on this footage just before the two walked walked into the flat was that as Megan was unlocking her door, the man started kind of looking around. He looked to his left and to his right. At one point, it looks as though he even looked directly at the security camera. And this stood out to the police. They theorised that perhaps the reason he appeared to be looking around was because he was the killer and he knew what he was about to do. His intention was to go into that flat and rape and kill Megan and so he glanced around the hall outside of Megan's flat before going in to see if anyone was around, to see if anyone had seen him there with her. So anyway, the two of them go into the flat and when the police watched the rest of the footage from that night, they realised that only one of them eventually left. Just over two hours later, at 5 54 a.m. the man is seen walking back out of Megan's flat alone and he goes to leave the building. However, he encounters a problem. To get out of the building, you need a key fob to open the door and he didn't have one. So after realising this, the man was seen actually going back into Megan's flat. He obviously grabbed her door fob. He then left again, opened the door with the fob and walked out. And when the police checked another CCTV camera from just outside of the building, they saw the moments after he walked out of the door. He was seen walking away from the building and as he did so, it looked as though on this footage that he threw something, an object or item to the ground. He threw it in the exact same spot where Megan's blood-stained keys were later found by that neighbour just hours later. So it was obviously Megan's keys that he had thrown to the ground. But possibly the most most incriminating piece of evidence. I mean, this is all very incriminating already, but even more incriminating. What made the police just even more certain that this man had to be the killer was that on another CCTV camera down the street, this man was seen again after having just walked away from the building, from the crime scene. And as he did so, as he was walking down this street, he was captured on this CCTV camera looking down at one of his hands. And this hand was red. His hand was covered 
covered in blood. Of course, it was looking extremely likely that this was Megan's blood on his hands from where he had just viciously stabbed her to death. So this CCTV footage was the breakthrough in the case. The police had the killer on video. This was hopefully going to make it a hell of a lot easier to identify him. And it did. It wasn't long at all before the detectives learned of this man's name. In fact, as I understand it, it was a fellow police officer with the Staffordshire Police or someone else who worked in the police force who actually identified the young man. They recognised him because it transpires that just the evening before Megan's body was found, this young man was at the local police station because he was being detained due to the fact that he had ketamine in his possession. They identified the man on this footage as being Joseph Trevor. So just for a bit of extra information about Joseph Trevor, he was 18 years old at the time that this case occurred, so he was the same age as Megan. According to articles, he lived in an area called Trentham in Stoke-on-Trent, and he was actually no stranger to Megan Newton. They knew each other well, and they had done for a long time. It turns out that they went to the same high school school and they were friends. Well, they were friendly. I don't think they were close friends in school at all, but they knew of each other and they would, you know, say hi to one another if they saw each other. And by all accounts, Joseph Trevor had a pretty normal life. He had a good life. He came from a good, well-respected family. Almost unbelievably, both of his parents actually worked in the police force. They were police officers. I believe Joseph always did well in school. He was intelligent and much like Megan, he absolutely thrived in sports, particularly in football. He was actually a semi-pro footballer for Newcastle Town Football Club and apparently he had secured himself a football scholarship in America, so he was planning on moving there at some point, I think. So he had a bright future ahead of him and the majority of people that knew him just thought of him as being a nice, friendly, sociable guy, or at least sometimes. He was always like that. Apparently there was also what's been described as a darker side to Joseph Trevor. Whilst he could be very friendly and chatty sometimes, other times he could apparently just switch and suddenly be the complete opposite. He would be quiet and quite rude and abrupt if you tried to speak with him and it seemed to be for no reason. It was like nothing necessarily triggered this side of him. It was just like one day he was nice and friendly, the next he wasn't and you never knew which side of Joseph Trevor to expect and when the detectives investigating Megan Newton's murder identified Joseph Trevor as being the guy with Megan in the CCTV footage on the night of her death, when they began looking more into Trevor's background, some very alarming information about his past emerged. They discovered that about three years earlier, so when he was around 15 years old, Joseph Trevor had been accused of sexually assaulting another teenage girl. Now, this is allegedly because nothing ever came of this in terms of being prosecuted. He wasn't charged or convicted of this offence. However, literally everyone knew about it. All of his classmates at school found out about this accusation and it did lead to Joseph Trevor often being called a predator and a paedophile by some of his peers. And when when the police found out about this accusation, as I said, I, I think it just made alarm bells ring even more because, as we know, Megan had been sexually assaulted. She had been raped by her killer, something that the now top suspect, Joseph Trevor, had been accused of before. So upon identifying Joseph Trevor as the top suspect in the case, the police began looking into his movements from the night in question. Obviously, they knew from the CCTV that he ended up getting in the same taxi as Megan that night and going back to her flat with her. But what had he been doing before that? And why did he end up going to Megan's flat? And they discovered that again, like Megan, Joseph Trevor was also on a night out with his school friends that evening. In fact, he and his friends just happened to be in the same nightclub as Megan and her friends. And because they all knew each other from school, they said hello to each other. Megan said hello to Joseph. However, it wasn't long before Joseph was actually kicked out of the club. He was kicked out because the security of the club noticed that
that he was carrying a bag of ketamine. And so I believe they actually called the police and Joseph Trevor was taken into custody. Although he wasn't charged with anything in relation to this, as far as I'm aware, it was just literally taken off of him at the police station and then he was let go and the police told him to just go back to his house. But he didn't. He didn't go back home. Instead, he went back to the nightclub where Megan was and at around 2.40 a.m. after Megan had left the nightclub, she bumped into Joseph Trevor. I believe he told Megan about what had just happened at the police station and he said that he didn't want to go home because he had been drinking a lot of alcohol and if you recall, his parents were police officers. So he told Megan that he was too scared to go home because he was worried about what his police officer parents would do or say when they found out that he had been arrested for possession of drugs. So yeah, he didn't know what to do. He had nowhere to go that night and Megan tried to help him. She let Joseph Trevor use her mobile phone to get in touch with one of his friends, I think to see if he could stay with them that night, but for whatever reason, he had no luck with that. And so Megan, being the kind and considerate person she was, she actually said to Joseph Trevor, well, you can come and stay at mine for the night if you need to. You can come and sleep on my sofa. And Trevor accepted this offer and that's why he was seen on the CCTV footage getting into the taxi with Megan and her other friend. Once inside the taxi, Joseph Trevor apparently sent a text message to his father in which he lied and said that he was going to stay at one of his guy friend's houses that night. The taxi then dropped Megan's girlfriend off at their house first and then it drove Megan and Joseph towards Megan's address. They were caught on another CCTV camera walking down the street, I think near her block of flats, and then as we know, they were caught on camera inside her building outside of her front door. And then they went inside and more than two hours later, Joseph was seen leaving the flat alone and he had blood on his hands. So of course the police were certain that in those two hours, Joseph Trevor brutally murdered Megan Newton. I mean, there was no way that he could even try and deny this. All of the evidence pointed directly to him. And so it wasn't long before the police set out to make the arrest. Although, oddly enough, Joseph Trevor's parents were actually one step ahead of the detectives because it turns out that Joseph Trevor actually confessed to them. He admitted to them that he had involvement in Megan's death. You see, the detectives would soon learn that after leaving Megan's flat just before 6am that morning, Joseph Trevor actually went straight to a bridge which was over the A500 road in Stoke-on-Trent. And he literally sat on this bridge with his legs hanging off of the side of the railing so that he was facing the road below. It seemed as though he was contemplating suicide. Perhaps he panicked after what he had just done to Megan and he thought that it was only a matter of time before he was arrested. Maybe he didn't want to have to deal with the consequences of his actions and so he considered just ending it all, ending his life so that he didn't have to deal with those consequences. But a member of the public who saw him hanging off the bridge immediately called the police because it looked like he was going to jump. And so when officers arrived at the scene, he was taken to the hospital for a mental health assessment. However, it was ultimately determined that it was safe for him to be discharged and he went back home. And once he was home, he confessed to his mum. Clearly he couldn't keep it in for much longer and he knew that there was no way he would be able to deny this. So he sent his mum a text message in which he admitted that he was responsible for Megan's death. Apparently his words were that he had quote done something bad and some sources also state that he sent some of his friends a text message with words to the same effect. Joseph's mother immediately called the police reporting her son's confession although by this point in time the detective Detectives had just identified Joseph Trevor as their top suspect because of the CCTV evidence and I think they were literally just getting ready to arrest him anyway. Following his arrest he was taken to the police station where he was questioned and as I understand it he kind of 
kind of partially confessed to the crime. So his story from that night was that it was him on the CCTV footage. He did go back to Megan's flat because she was kind enough to offer him a place to stay that night. And he claimed that when they arrived back there, the two of them had sex, consensual sex. And then he said that after sleeping together, for some reason, it was like he just blacked out. His memory went completely blank and he couldn't recall what happened next or what he did following the sex. So I don't think he was necessarily denying the murder. He was kind of saying to the detectives in his statement, well, it must have been me. I must have been the killer, but I cannot actually remember carrying out the attack. Clearly, this was his attempt at trying to make out like he wasn't this calculated, cold-blooded murderer. By saying he couldn't remember what he did, it was almost like he was trying to claim that he couldn't fully be held responsible for his actions. And apparently, he also also later claimed that one memory he did have from that night was of Megan actually apologizing to him. So if you remember earlier on in the video, I mentioned that when Joseph Trevor was 15 years old and he was accused of sexually assaulting another teenage girl, several of his classmates at the time called him out on this. They called him names like predator and pedophile. Apparently some of his classmates even started calling him Rolf Harris. Rolf Harris was a famous TV personality who was a convicted paedophile and sex offender. And apparently, Joseph Trevor kind of implied that on the night of Meghan's death, she apologised to him because he claimed that she was one of the classmates who called him a paedophile in school. And so on the night of her murder, she apparently said sorry for that. And Trevor said that this apology triggered him and it made him go into this blind rage and that that must have been when he strangled and stabbed Megan to death. However, as I'm sure you have probably guessed, the detectives did not believe this story. They did not believe for one second that his memory just conveniently went blank, that they believed that he was fully aware of what he was doing the entire time and they theorised that the reason he decided to kill Megan was probably because she rejected him that night. It's believed that upon arriving back to her flat, Joseph Trevor tried to get with Megan. He tried to initiate sex, but that she wasn't interested and she said no, and that this angered Joseph Trevor. He was furious with Megan for rejecting him, and so he didn't care that she said no. He decided that he was just going to rape her and then murder her to silence her so that she wouldn't be able to report him for the sexual assault. And so just a couple of days after Megan's death, he was charged. He was charged with murder and two counts of rape. Because from what I can gather from different news articles, it was determined that Megan had been raped in two ways that night, not just one. And when it came to his court proceedings a few months later, Joseph Trevor initially decided to plead not guilty to all charges, despite the fact that he'd basically already confessed. However, he eventually decided to change this plea. He chose to instead admit the murder charge. He was pleading guilty to murder. However, he still pleaded not guilty to the rape charges. He was still claiming that he and Megan had consensual sex that night. And he maintained this story for a long time, literally until the very first day of his trial. His trial began on the 17th of February 2020 and on the very first day he once again decided to change his plea and as well as pleading guilty to murder he now decided to plead guilty to the two counts of rape too. And let's be honest he probably just did this because he didn't want to have to face the trial. He probably knew that the jury would see through his lies so what was the point in pleading not guilty? So now he just had to be sentenced and for what he did to Megan he received life in prison with a minimum of 21 years and shockingly at the end of his sentencing Megan's mother Sarah actually said that her daughter's killer Joseph Trevor turned and looked at Sarah and he mouthed the word sorry 
to her which as you can imagine absolutely infuriated Sarah I'm sure she must have just thought how dare you try to act remorseful saying sorry does not change anything and if he really was sorry then why did he only plead guilty to the rape charges on the first day of the trial why put Megan's family through those agonizing months of waiting for the trial when he could have just admitted his guilt straight away and the sentencing could have been over and done with quicker. Sorry at that point is just an insult, isn't it really? Sorry doesn't bring Sarah's daughter back. Sorry doesn't just undo Joseph Trevor's horrendous and evil actions from that night. In the aftermath of this case, funds were raised so that Megan's friends and family could pay for a memorial bench for her. And this bench is located in a lovely area in a local park in Stoke-on-Trent. It overlooks a big pond and an area where kids can play football football so it seemed to be the perfect place a very fitting tribute for Megan but that concludes this case that is the case of Megan Newton it's so unbelievable and heartbreaking that Megan was killed by an evil monster while she was just trying to be kind to him she literally offered Joseph Trevor a place to stay that night out of the goodness of her heart so that he wouldn't be out on the street and this is what he did to to repay her but yeah that is it for this case as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments and also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel they can be solved cases unsolved cases serial killer cases again you can let me know in the comments down below or alternatively i do have a case request form linked in the description box please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!